Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Kevin Ames, a true professional. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much, David. It's always good to be back at uh, B&H Photo Video. And I, I really do want to thank Jim and uh, all the folks at Dynalite for bringing me in. I use their gear. I love it. It goes all over the world with me. Uh, and I actually have to rent inverters when I'm there because they don't work on 220 yet, right? Yes. Yet. And Sigma lenses, I am a sponsored Sigma Pro. And in this program, you're going to see all kinds of different lenses because I haven't always used Sigma. And I've used them, surprisingly, for a lot of my career. So I want to talk about light and lens, the art of creative seeing. This is really a program about how I do my work as a commercial photographer. And I'm going to show you the different lenses that I use, because I thought it was really interesting. I used Lightroom to figure out what the quantity of lenses I was and I was using and how many exposures. And it might give you an insight in how uh, you can work with your camera to make lens decisions. And all of the photographs you see in here that are in the studio are lit with Dynalite. And I'll be showing some of the examples of how that works uh, as we go through. But in seeing, in seeing, it's thinking differently about what it is you're looking at. So what are you seeing here? Is it a star cluster? Or could it be Christmas lights at the Atlanta Botanical Garden and rotating a camera on the tripod so you get the circular motion? That's actually what it was. By the way, you'll see what lenses shot each picture along with the camera. I'll super those over for you. Outside, we work with available light, natural light, to make really beautiful images. It's soft and wonderful. And you'll see that I've been working, this is shot with a Sigma SD9, back when a really good, high-quality digital camera really wasn't available. This was back in the days of the early, early Canons, the uh, D10s. And the Sigma SD9 is the first camera to actually be able to, for every pixel, to see all of the colors, red, green, and blue. So I was working with those because of my work with their original, their parent company, Foveon. They made the first digital camera that could deliver a big enough file to make a portrait or a magazine cover in color. Before that, all of the captures were either done with three exposures, one for red, one for green, one for blue, which meant the person had to stand still for over 30 seconds and they couldn't do it, or a scanning back, and that would take two or three minutes to expose. So again, it was out of the realm for color portraits. The three-shot camera did great black and white, and I'll show you an image made with that later. So photography that we love, we now have great tools that allow us to do things that we've never been able to do before. This is last 4th of July. This is over Atlanta. And I was invited to a party and I said, great, can I bring my camera? So I, I bring my camera and my tripod and my 70 to 200 millimeter f2.8. And I sit up on the balcony and everybody else is having a really good time and I'm making photographs. They saw the individual pictures that you saw. This is what I saw in my head. This is what I mean by creative seeing. So I'm using Photoshop in this case to put all of these images together to get the image that I felt when I was there, not necessarily the one that I saw. This is quartz crystal. This was shot on film with a Sinar P 4x5 camera and a 90 millimeter Rodenstock lens. This is the stuff they make fiber optics out of. This was done for Horaeus Amersil. It's a commercial client, and they wanted to show how pure their quartz crystal was. And so I lit it with a spotlight, literally a spotlight you, like you'd see in the theater, and it's transmitting through the quartz crystal. There's no special effects on this. This is actually done in camera because this was, uh, well, it was BC and BP before computers, before Photoshop. So you had to do everything live. This, uh, this photograph is the one that, uh, for those of you that picked up the Photoshop user magazine and the digital photographer's notebook column, this is one of the photographs featured in that article that you have. And our new cameras now that we're working with are so detailed and the lenses are so good that you can see things you've never seen before. Do you notice that right around her eye there's kind of a transparent line? Everybody see that? <coughs> That's her contact lens. That's her contact lens. 
We've never been able to see that when we were shooting film. Even when we were shooting 4x5, the resolution just wasn't there. So the tools that we have today to make images are far better than anything we've ever had before. And they reveal more detail because the lens quality is better than it's ever been. So I was curious. I wanted to know what my lenses were by the numbers. Because there are people that do things, you know, there are accountants in the world. And so I thought I would put on my photographic accounting hat for a minute and see where everything played out. So I picked four cameras to work with. A my Canon 1DS Mark II, which I sold for the 1DS Mark III, a 7D, and a 5D Mark II. I've taken 140,000 photographs with those, two, those four camera bodies. And this is the way it laid out. So 44,700 with a 24 to 70, 67,300 with the 70 to 200, 17,700 with a fixed 85 millimeter, and 4,300 with a 12 to 24 for a total of 134,000 images or 96% of everything I shoot. So people say, where should I start in my lens kit? Well, the first thing is either a 70 to 200 or a 24 to 70. Those are the two go-to lenses and they will cover more of your area of work than any other lenses you could want. So here you see the four cameras and how I got it was I keep all of my photographs cataloged in Lightroom. And if you go up to the very top of the screen when you're in the grid mode, you'll see text, attribute, metadata, and uh, I can't even read it from here. You click on the metadata and you can actually choose the cameras that you shoot with. Well, as you can see, I've shot with a lot of cameras over the years, but these are my four primary cameras. Then I select all of the images, and in the film strip mode, it will come up and tell me how many shots I've made. So I rounded the numbers because I'm not a tax accountant. I don't need it close to the penny. But it gave me an idea, and you can see that the focal lengths went all the way from 8 millimeter to 600. Now the 600, I don't own a 600 millimeter lens. I do own a Sigma 120 to 300 f2.8 and a Sigma 2x teleconverter that I put on that lens, which makes it a 240 to 600 millimeter f5.6. So I thought I'd share with you the lens kits that I use predominantly for the different areas that my commercial business covers. Beauty and fashion, commercial and corporate, architecture and interiors, travel and personal. So beauty and fashion, take a look at that. This is shot with the SD-1 Merrill, which is Sigma's 46 megapixel APS-C crop sensor size camera that delivers true color fidelity because of the Foveon technology I mentioned earlier. So for beauty and fashion, my favorite lens is the 85-1.4. When I first got started in photography, I was shooting a Nikon F2. So now you can go back and figure out how old I am. Okay, I was born in 1952. I was 11 years old uh, when Kennedy was assassinated 50 years ago. So I love that lens. I've since lost it. When Sigma came out with the 85-1.4, I could hardly wait. And from the numbers, you've noticed that since it was introduced two years ago, I've shot almost 18,000 pictures with it. The 24 to 70 is the next one. I use that a lot particularly when I need to change the composition without moving the camera forward and backwards. And when I want compression in the image, I use the 70 to 200. Now for the opening section of this with the girl with the crazy makeup, that was shot with the 150-2.8 macro lens. So I'm not locked into specific lenses for any specific purpose. I'm always changing to see if I can come up with that slightly different look. Now. If you go back in history and look at photographs, and since the uh, Kennedy assassination is kind of on everybody's minds, it happened, uh, well, it happened 50 years ago, three days ago, there are some pictures where all you see are the sharpness of, his eyes are sharp and everything else is out of focus. That was because the format back then was 8x10 and the lens on the camera was a 270 millimeter lens. Well, the longer the lens, the shorter the depth of field and the film emulsions weren't all that fast back then. So they really had to shoot close to wide open, which on those lenses was usually 5.6 as the maximum aperture. So you could see that there were problems that we no longer face. 
And that also means that we've got creative issues that they didn't have because we have to work to get really shallow depth of field because we're using smaller format cameras. So for that, I use the 120 to 300. I'll zoom it out to 300 to make a portrait. And it works tremendously well for throwing the background out of focus. When I need something really unique with odd perspective, the 12 to 24 is a great choice. So these are my lens kits. Now let's look at some pictures and you can get an idea. This is available light. I have not manipulated the colors of her eyes. She's standing out by a swimming pool. So I've overexposed it just a little bit. And what's happened is the overexposure and the reflection of the blue water in the swimming pool and the blue sky have really filled in her eyes and made them just absolutely vibrant in the color. So I'm constantly looking for things that can add color to eyes and to make the picture more than what it looks like when you just see it. You'll see some more pictures of Lily in a few minutes. This goes back a long time ago, as uh, it's been alluded to, I've been doing this a long time. This was shot with my Hasselblad 500 ELM and 150 millimeter Hasselblad lens. And you'd think that you're looking at someone peering through a torn screen door. Lexi is actually standing in my studio. It's lit with Dynalite lights and the material is screen door screening. I went to the hardware store and bought a roll of it, which I periodically pull out. Uh, and I'll show you some other uses for it later in the program. And I just had her tear it. She, I've actually got a picture of her ripping it apart and laughing. But this was the portrait that I saw in my head and wanted to make. So being creative using very simple things, there's just a white wall behind her. And because the light is in really close, I had to use a uh, very small aperture and it makes the background darker. Editorial for magazine again. This is another. Uh, this is another issue of Jezebel for the most eligibles. These are the guys. Probably not my favorite subject. Not nearly as much fun as shooting the women. This is shot again. It's lit with a soft box, uh, a rime light soft box. Lighting them and then I'm dragging the shutter, really long shutter speed, telling the ladies to hold really still to get the background lights. Those are called practicals. Anytime you see a light inside a photograph that adds illumination, it's called a practical. Then my job as a photographer is to raise or lower the exposure to make the practical work for me. I shoot everything into a computer tethered so I can check the exposure, I can check the focus, I can make sure that everything is exactly the way the client wants it. And I would really encourage you to learn how to shoot tethered as well. Most cameras now will tether into Lightroom directly. And this gives you a way of seeing your work as you create it. And you can make any changes that you want as you're doing the work rather than having to uh, <clears throat> fix it in Photoshop. I suggest very strongly that Photoshop is a finishing tool, not a repair facility. The uh, macro lens, again, is really, really wonderful. I love working with them and occasionally do some crazy kind of makeup and stuff. And you'll see some more stuff like this. You've already seen one. But this is done to show off the quality of the lens. Occasionally, I want to crop in and just show the eyes. Did you notice that she's wearing colored contact lenses? I, I'm not locked in to DSLR cameras. I carry a little Sony NEX7 practically everywhere I go, and I have no problem at all putting a pocket wizard on it and using it with my Dynalites. This is done with a, a light called the uh, Grand, and I'm lighting her with just one light, and it's got a really unique feature, and I really, I really want you to learn about this light. It's the Rime Light Grands. What they do is they concentrate the light in the center and it falls off really, really quickly. So it creates a natural vignette. Put a, put a single head inside and it's amazing. So this is, a, this is the kind of light you get with that. It's shot with a Sigma 60 millimeter f2.8 lens. Like I said, on my walk around camera, the Sony NEX7. Caricatures. 
This is done with the SD9 and lens that I wish Sigma still made. It was the 15 to 30 at 15 millimeters. All I did was get up on a ladder, put it ultra wide and shoot down on Rachel and got this wonderful caricature. It also has the effect of really making her body thin and rail-like. Now, another challenge is I do shoot fashions for websites and for catalogs. This particular garment is supposed to be slightly translucent. Hope is wearing boy shorts, white boy shorts, underneath this outfit, and they wanted to see them coming through. Well, I've got her lit properly, her face is perfectly exposed, but there's too much light on the gauzy top. So my challenge is I've got to take light away from that without changing the light on her face. To do that, I use what's known as a scrim. Remember the screen door screening I talked to you about earlier? Well, if you take that same screen door screening and put it in a frame and paint it black, it will reduce the quantity of light without changing the quality. So here's the difference. And now you can see that the material actually is gauzy without showing too much, and the boy shorts show through. Here's the setup. You can see the camera. There's an overhead light. This is a, this is a Rhyme Light 1 by 36 inch strip light. In the background, there are four Dynalite heads into 8 foot by 4 foot V flats, and I'll talk more about those later, to make the background completely white. Then there's my favorite beauty dish and the scrim. The scrim is the thing that's covered in red. It looks like a gray flag, but it's just knocking down the amount of light on Hope's body without affecting the light on her face. And here you can see them side by side. So scrims are great tools for lighting where you need to take a little bit away without having to change all of the light. After the job is over with, I play. Uh, I, one of my Christmas presents to myself one year was a great indulgence. Dynalite makes this amazing ring, ring flash, and I bought one. And this was shot with that and the 150 f2.8 Sigma macro lens. I moved in really, really close. And you can see the distinctive ring uh, flash catch lights, those little circles with the black dot in the center. The black dot is the lens. So it's just an incredible combination. But you've got to be really careful because it's totally shadowless and it's a very recognizable light source. So I use it sparingly because I don't want to become known as the ring flash guy. On the other hand, if I overexpose it and really make her lips super saturated before I take the picture, uh, okay, anybody seen Rocky Horror? I think it's just a great picture of her lips. Again, the 150 macro. So let's move on to another area of my commercial business. This is the corporate side. And here are the lenses that I wind up using a lot. And I shoot all kinds of different things because in Atlanta, you really don't specialize as much as a photographer would here in New York. So the 12 to 24 is a great lens. I use that a lot. The same kit lenses, that are not, not kit lenses, but my original kit of 24 to 70, 70 to 200 come into play. So you can see I'm getting a lot of use out of those two. The fisheye, use that once in a while, because again, I, just as much as I, I don't want to be the ring flash guy, I don't want to be the fisheye guy either. The 85 14, and then the macro lenses. Uh, this is shot with a 105. And I love shooting food. Now, food is really, really difficult until you learn the secret. I'm going to tell you what the secret is right now. Hire a food stylist. Chefs are not food stylists. They cook for taste, but they think they are. They think they can plate food and make it look great for the camera, and it's just not true. So this was commissioned to show off the quality of the SD-1 camera from Sigma. They hired me to actually shoot the camera with different food types. And so we did this chocolate shot. Now, I want you to let me zoom in for just a second and take a look at the quality and the dynamic range of what they wanted to see. You can see the uh, texture in the ribbon. You can see texture in the uh, cupcake. And 
back into the wood that it's sitting on as well as the stone that it's sitting on. So an amazing quality camera. Again, a very simple lighting setup. This happens to be uh, just a side lit light from behind with the beauty dish. This is lit through a glass brick. I just put a glass brick on a clamp, put a Dynalite head behind it, and then a reflector. Uh, this is a standard, from what I understand, Scandinavian breakfast of cheese, crackers, and radishes, and bread. Again, shooting straight down. Salads. See what a food stylist does? Every piece of that Parmesan cheese is placed with a pair of tweezers. So it's just really, really lovely. And this is just shot with a straight 50 millimeter lens. This is fun. This is actually an artist, uh, uh, Buxton Kutch, here in Brooklyn. And uh, I had this piece. This is, this is a charity bit. They lost their uh, studio to Hurricane Sandy. And uh, a friend of mine had a piece of their work. And so I photographed it as a gift to help them get back on their feet. Any skill that we have, we really, I think it's important that we share it with others that we can do to make their lives a little bit better. So this again is the macro lens and uh, it's lit basically from behind. And yeah, I let some of it burn out, but it's an art piece of glass. So that's, it's more an interpretation than it is the actual quality of the work. I'm more interested in how the piece looks than some technical issues. Now, on the other hand, technical. This piece is about this big. This is a pendant made by a, a woman by the name of Marie Scarpa, and these are sapphires. I had no idea that sapphires came in so many different colors, but these are all different sapphires. And this brooch came to me to be photographed, and it had little tiny hairs where the woman that owns it had worn it on a sweater. So I spent hours with a pair of tweezers pulling those hairs out. And I ran into Marie a while later and she said, oh, getting rid of the hair is easy. Just hold it up and use a cigarette lighter. All right, now I'm not about to take a cigarette lighter to a piece of jewelry that has sapphires on it. Well, I probably will now because I know it's okay. But I wish I'd known that tip. So this is lit overhead. I've got a Rimelite softbox, the Dynalite head in it, single, I mean, 800 watt second power pack at 200 watt seconds. And since the brooch is really in one plane, I don't need a great big huge f-stop to keep everything sharp, to keep the depth of field from front to back. The background is the white wall in my studio, and I took a 20 degree grid, put it over another head, and I put this pink gel in front of it, again a Roscoe product, because I wanted to have the edges of it look about the same color as the center stone. So it was just a matter of adjusting the amount of power on the power pack till the colors matched. Again, I'm shooting it tethered so I can see what the colors are going to be, and then one shot and it's done. So very, very straightforward. Of course, there's some post-production. I did cut out the piece of piano wire that's holding it up and retouch that out in Photoshop. But I was careful about where it came off so I didn't have to retouch it out in between each of those little lines. So a little pre-planning helps a lot. Uh, another, this is a, a necklace piece. Uh, it's a piece of aquamarine. This whole piece is about this tall, about that wide. This is shot. Um, in my studio again, very similar technique, only I took the gel off of the light in the background. Uh, the amethyst is carved by uh, Bernd, Bernd Munsteiner, who is a very famous German uh, gem carver. From what I've been told by the designer, it's the only piece of purple gold in, in the world, and then it's in an 18 karat gold mounting. Part of the other challenge was I had to photograph every side of it rotating, so the solution was I hung it from a piece of piano wire that was suspended from a plexiglass disc and I could just turn the piano wire and take the pictures. This is the hero shot. Uh, I didn't want to bore you with all of the detail photographs, so they're not here. This is our government at work. Uh, Atlanta has a great big huge center for the Department of Labor and they're one of my clients. Interestingly, whenever you photograph for our government, you sign over your copyrights. These are public domain photographs. 
These are labor enforcement officers that are just graduating from their training. And you see this guy clear over on this side, I guess that would be the right hand side, by the uh, red sign. He thought this was a great location for everybody. I know he's a photographer. And uh, I said, this is probably not, well, I said, I'll do it. We'd already done the hero shot. I'll show that to you in a minute. And so everybody spreads out and I'm thinking, does he really want to stand there under that red sign that says no lifeguard on duty? So I crunch everybody together. And because we've got a lot more resolution, I can uh, crop the image 24 to 70 again and take the picture. Again, I've got the Dynalite pack filling in and I'm using their XP800 portable power system. And it just has AC outlets. I plug the pack into it and I can take it anywhere. So this is their shot. You notice he's got his mouth open. I'm going, okay. I mean, it's the best picture of him. <laughs> this is mine. Who wins? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So again, I've got the Dynalite up high, single head into an umbrella, bouncing down, and I've dragged the shutter to get the practicals. You see the light on the right-hand side uh, that's on the wall. I wanted that in there because otherwise it, looks, it would look dead. So this is a combination of the Dynalite and Daylight, and I think it works really well for them. Commercial work means spending the night on the rooftops of places sometimes. One of my clients is a high-end commercial heating and air conditioning company and a software company who has a building that is hidden in the middle of Buckhead, Atlanta. You don't even know it's there. So they've got about a 12-story building. So they called me up and said, we're changing the chillers out and we need a photograph with Buckhead skyline in the background. And so I had the evening to practice as they took the old chillers out and brought the new ones up. I knew that the, the last one that they put in would be the hero. So I waited, I did my tests. This again is shot with a Dynalite power pack. I've got a, uh, a C-stand with a head, just a bare bulb, not a bare bulb, but just a reflector head up tall. And I shot the photograph just as the sun was coming up. Now, these guys don't really do this. This is the job of the iron workers and those men are unbelievable in what they can do moving these things. These are multi-ton pieces of equipment and there's a great big huge crane. You can see it just off to the right hand side of the image. So this is one of their great website shots. They loved it. Uh, but but the, I moved the iron workers out really fast. I had about 45 seconds to shoot it with my two uh, uh, United Maintenance employees standing in to pull it down. So timing is everything. This is naturally seven. They tour all over the world. They're an a cappella group based out of Atlanta. Uh, currently they're on tour in Australia and Europe with Michael Buble. They back him up on a lot of his recordings. And they wanted uh, a singular image for their All the King's Men album. And so we came up with this. This is actually a composite. Every, every element in this, including the flag and the flagpole, are shot separately and composited into the shot. Each of the guys was shot individually and the background was shot individually and we put it all together. I put it all together in Photoshop. So the skills of finishing a photograph are really important because you never know when a client's going to say, can we take all of those individual images you shot and composite them into something else that we can use so that we don't have to spend the money on another photo shoot. Well, I got photo shoot money for sitting at my computer and doing this work. Architectural and interiors. This is where the 12 to 24 shines. I use it a lot, like in this photograph of the Orange County Convention Center in uh, Orlando, Florida. And I spend a lot of time lying down on my back with the camera looking straight up. It is a wonderful angle and I highly recommend it to you. I also do it for interior photographs and not all of my photography is what you'd want to call glamorous. This is early, early in the morning out in Roswell, Georgia, taking a picture of a dentist's office. And what was important to them was not only having the sign, a lot of the, um, a lot of the orange neon had burned out, so I put that back in in Photoshop. But they also wanted to see 
the facility behind the lines. So I had to wait and balance the light. They've since changed the sign. The doctor now has a logo. So one of my assignments when I get back this uh, December is to re-photograph it. And the neon is gone, so we've got to do the exterior again. Speaking of exteriors and balancing light, this was shot uh, back in uh, 2004 on Christmas Day because it was the only time I could actually make a portrait of the Idaho State Capitol building with all of the lights and the tree where there weren't a huge amount of people around. I snuck into a ca uh, parking garage. I knew it was closed. Nobody would give me a bad time. Parked the car just off the side and used my porter case to carry all of my gear up. Got there about four in the afternoon and stayed until well after dark. So I was up there about four or five hours. And here's the setup. Camera's on the tripod. I'm tethered to the computer and I'm making the series of images as the shadows crawl across the face of the building until the shadow, the sun is down far enough to put the light that you saw. So I shoot the entire series and if I need to put something together in Photoshop, I've got the images I need. Interiors again. This was shot before, I, before the 12 to 24 existed. This is the 17 to 40 on uh, my Canon 1DS Mark II. It's an interior for a spa. Same idea here. Now this is lit with the light that's there except for the light in the showers. There were no real lights in the shower which was kind of weird because the spa went to the trouble of putting LED lights in the bathtub. Why wouldn't there be light in the shower? I have no idea. So I had my lighting kit with me. I had my assistant go into the shower with a Dynalite pack and a head and a blue gel. And so she's standing there painting just with the modeling light on the shower doors while I make the time exposure for these photographs right here. Dermatologist's office, 12 to 24 millimeter lens. One of the things I love about this is I can level the camera shoot with the lens. I don't have any distortion at all. I don't have to fix anything in Photoshop. I just crop out all of the extra ceiling and floor. With these high resolution cameras that we can get today, there's no real need to purchase a tilt shift lens. Here you can see an interior of an exam room, which is uh, very, very small. It's like a 12 by 12 foot room, but that lens makes it look huge. I use it as well for architecture, exteriors. This is a house in Buckhead, Atlanta, a lot of stately homes. And this was done for a landscaping company. When I travel, I take my camera and I probably carry too much stuff, but I'm so glad I do. This is Monhegan Island off the coast of Maine. It takes about an hour to get to it by boat. And this is right after sunrise. And okay, I will admit there's a tiny bit of Photoshop in there. Like those two uh, gulls weren't really exactly there. I kind of moved them around. And the harbor wasn't exactly that clean. I kind of cleaned it up a little bit. The chairs were exactly where they were. And I believe that since we're photographers, we don't have the advantage that painters have. Painters put what they want on the canvas. Our only challenge, or I mean our only choice really, is to take away what we don't want. And so when I look at a scene, I'm deciding what I'm going to do in Photoshop as I shoot it. And I would encourage you to look at photography that way. Not to fix, to finish. Photoshop is a finishing tool, it's not a repair shop. I went to, um, I went to Paris for my 60th birthday last year. And one of my challenges to myself was to make a singular photograph of the Eiffel Tower that I'd never seen before and that probably most people hadn't seen. How'd I do? Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. This is shot with the 24 to, uh, I'm sorry, the 70 to 200 and the 2X, not the 2X teleconverter. I'll show you that in a minute. 20, uh, it's at 200 millimeters and it's shot from on top of a department store. Now, being able to chat people up and talk with them is really, really fun. So I'm up there. I've got the camera set up on the tripod. It's weighted. I'm ready to go. And the server that's running that part of the 
there's a garden on top, comes up to me and he says, you know you have to leave at 7.30. And I said, yeah, no problem. And I'm kind of going, darn it, because sunset isn't until uh, 7.54. But, you know, I'm going to get the pictures anyway. And uh, he says, so you're a photographer? And I said, yes, I am. Where are you from? Well, I'm from America, from the States. (laughs) Really? Do you use Photoshop? Well, yes, I do. Do you ever read Photoshop User Magazine? And I said, yeah, I do. He said, my favorite column is the Digital Photographer's Notebook. And I'm sitting there going, oh, God, life couldn't be this good. (laughs) Really, thank you. I said, well, hi, I'm Kevin Ames. I write the column. (gasps) You can stay. So I got to stay till 7.54. I got my sunset shot. And as soon as I got back to the apartment I was staying in, I put it together and emailed him this photograph. You got to say thank you to the people that help you out. I mean, because he could have lost his job, but he wanted to see what I was doing. So it was fun. Here's the 70 to 200 with a 2x teleconverter. That's how you get a 270 millimeter lens out of a 200 millimeter lens. And interestingly, Sigma's first product was the 2X teleconverter. They invented it. So Nikon, Canon, everybody that has 2X teleconverters copied Sigma. Kind of interesting, isn't it? So this is uh, the harbor in Vancouver. Uh, Not on a tripod, but I'll give you a hint. When you're shooting this kind of stuff, put your camera on high-speed motor drive, brace yourself, take a deep breath, let it out, push the shutter down and let it fire half a dozen frames. One of them is going to be sharp because you'll have steadied down and it'll work really well. And that's how I did this shot. I was in the Space Needle when it first opened in uh, 1962. I went back, yeah, that number of years later and uh, made this photograph. This is shot from the parking deck of the Seattle Opera and there was construction all going around and so I chatted up the security guard there and said well you know I'd I'd love to make this I told him the story about being you know like 10 years old when this was when the World's Fair was there and he says you can come back in the morning just let yourself into the parking lot and go ahead and shoot and if anybody gives you trouble just sell them just tell them Kathy said it's okay so again asking permission is a good thing This is one of my favorite sculptures in the world. This is the St. Louis Arch, and I don't always have a tripod with me. So here I did this HDR photograph with the uh, the 24 to 70, and I'm leaning up against the arch. I've got all my weight on the camera, and I'm letting it do the HDRs. I'm squeezing them off. Well, this is a pretty solid structure, so it really doesn't matter. And I'm looking, I'm almost, I'm almost again lying down. Here's another view of it on a different trip. Same kind of idea, except I had the tripod this time. And of course, finally, the standard view of it. Now, here I've used Camera Raw to intensify the blues, the reds, and the greens, which is really easy because you've got sliders that allow all of the colors to be controlled individually. And that's where the vibrant colors come from in this photograph. I love photography. I'm never going to use a picture of a kite against a sky, but I love the photograph. I love the way the clouds are kind of streaming diagonally along with the kite. So I made the picture. I don't know what I'll do with it, but I like it. And that's enough. It becomes a personal photograph. And that's part of the wonder of what we do as photographers. Uh, This is Arcadia State Park in Maine. Walking along. 12 to 24, as wide as it can be. I saw this kind of water pathway, and I made a photograph. I like it. That's all you need. You don't have to justify your work to anybody unless you're getting paid for it. It's just a matter of what you like. Atlanta has an amazing cemetery that's now a public park. You can book a wedding here. Corporate meetings are held here. Uh, they have something on the, in October called Tunes from the Tombs. And it's a very interesting place. This is a Confederate um, cemetery. And working with the lens at its shortest focal length tells one story. Zooming it in a little bit tells a whole nother. Where you've got the lone tombstones, here, and this should be 165, here you've actually got the tree looking over the dead. So two different stories, 
just by changing the focal length. So again, I would encourage you when you're shooting, put your tripods up, take pictures. I know it's hard. I, I know that it's difficult to use a tripod in the city. I know that. I do it anyway. And of course, I can always play the, I'm really not from around here, officer card, which you probably can't get away with. And again, find something really, really small, open the aperture up all the way, focus on it, some dandelions in front of some tombstones. I took the tripod, turned the center column upside down, and I'm lying on my stomach. Are we looking up or are we looking down? 70 millimeters, 24 to 70, what do you think? Well, it looks like the sky above when in reality what you're seeing is the ocean below. This again is an Arcadia State Park in Maine and I'm looking down a very sheer cliff. It's early, early in the morning. The sun has just barely cleared the horizon and I'm still able to take a 30 second time exposure to change the water into sky. Now you can see a little bit differently. Um, 30 seconds, F22. I knew it would be a real boring photograph all in blue like this, so I took my LED flashlight out of my camera case and just painted the white rock. And this is an example of using the brightness of the image to direct your eye where I want you to see. So here you have no choice but to look at that white rock. No matter if you look away, you're always going to come back to it. Back on Monhegan Island, I found this rowboat and these wonderfully red tiled buildings and made a photograph. It was foggy, it was low contrast, and the light was spectacular. Stuff that you wouldn't really equate with a great photograph, and I think it works like a charm. Hewitt Island in Maine, again the 24, the 12 to 24 at 12 millimeters. Really ultra wide and a great way to view things. Kind of neat. But you don't always have to use the wide angle lens for travel photographs. These are the Blue Ridge Mountains in Georgia. And this is shot at 300 millimeters with that 120 to 300 millimeter lens I was telling you about. Look at how it compresses the mountains. This is just at dusk. There's a lake in the foreground. It's not really a river. It's a lake, but because of the compression, it looks like a river. And you get these mountains stacking up in the background. Gorgeous. On the other hand, back to the 24 to 70. This is a lake formed out of a volcano with a volcano inside it. This is in Taal, which is part of the Philippines. It's south of Manila and away from the uh, tsunami that they just had and the typhoon they just had. So this area was not affected. But really phenomenal country, great for wide angle travel photography. 12 to 24, I really wanted to get out, but there was no place to park the car. So we drove alongside this guy on his uh, motorcycle, his tricycle motorcycle. We're going, we've just passed the U.S. Embassy and I'm hanging out the window taking pictures. I've got another one where he's looking back but the composition is wrong. So this is my hero for that shot. Um, I still shoot fashion wherever I go. Here I have uh, a photograph made in uh, Tagaytay, which is in the Philippines, again north of Manila. and. This is the same room. The room on the right is the one that she is standing next to in front of. So if you walk through this doorway and turn right, this is what you'd see. And I think it's really interesting that the plumbing they have is an urn where you pour water in. So that's how they, they had water in this particular house. They had drains, but they didn't have running water. So the picture on the right is available light. The picture on the left is carefully lit. I've got a rhyme light. Rhyme light actually and Dynalight distributes them. Rhyme light actually makes mono lights. So I was using these because they work on 240 volts. So I could use those overseas. And I'm lighting her and I've got another one in the background just lowering the contrast a little bit so it doesn't look like she's standing against a bunch of black in the background. That's why it looks like there's light on the pots and pans back there. It's because I lit it. So I'm constantly looking at how a scene is going to work and if I need to bring in lighting. And if I need to, I'm certainly going to do it. 
Another view uh, of the Philippines early, early in the morning. I believe this is from Corregidor, looking back. Lenses that don't belong at the event. I went to an air show with my 7D and an 8 to 16 millimeter lens to shoot the air show, and I decided I was nuts until Aeroshell started performing, and I was the only one that was able to get this shot. I'm standing right on the fence by the runway. This airport is about two miles from my studio, so it's really easy to get to. No, it's not Hartsfield where all the, all the busyness is. This is an executive air, airport about 12 miles from there. And unbelievable. If I hadn't had that ultra wide angle lens, yeah, I'd have been able to get pictures of the airplanes, but I'd never seen the contrails. So I think, I think the story tells itself. So I quite often, for my own personal work, put myself in situations that are wrong lens wise. I'm doing a series called The Red Dress. I'm fo I've got this red dress and I'm photographing different models in it to see what they do with it. And these are the first three in the series. Uh, this is Svetlana and she's chosen to be very sculptural. I forget this lady's name, but she wanted to do a flamenco look. And again, using the dyna lights, I can stop that action. And there's enough light that I don't have to worry about running out. I can shoot as quickly as I want to shoot which is something I just can't do with portable electronic flashes. And then this is the front of the dress just draped over the lady's head. So three different views, same dress. This again is that big parabolic rhyme light reflector. And this is just one of those things, I love this look. This 50s look with the hat and the mesh. And what we can do now with our lenses and our cameras unbelievable with the quality. Look at the mesh on that hat. And more importantly, take a look in her eyes. Do you see that really great catch light? That's what that Rhyme Light Grand does. It's a 16-sided light and you put a head in it and it gives this wonderful catch light unlike anything else. And they're relatively inexpensive. If you buy one of these from uh, Braun Color or Breeza, you're talking $12,000. This one, I think, is right around 500. So it's really a great value. An umbrella. Two lights, a Dynalite power pack, and an umbrella. One on the background, one on the model. Very, very easy. OK, carry your camera everywhere, because you never know. You never know when you're going to get that photograph. Uh, this photograph was made back in 2004, and that's Steve and his wife at the dedication of the Apple Store in San Francisco. Okay, thank you all very much. Support Sigma, support B&H, support Dynalite. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.